So, I, um, I would like to uh, invite you to ask questions. Uh, my goal today is to bring you some new information. Because this is actually a very advanced forum. There may be a parent or two here who's, who's here for the first time and they're saying, my head is spinning and what do I do? And is it, how, what, how do I feed them? Yes, but you'll get all the help you need. There are also many parents here who've been there, done that, and who are ready for uh, restoring our children's health 2.0. And so what we are hoping to talk about a little bit is that 2.0. Because if you go into good remission with your anorexia nervosa, which is a brain disorder, and the disease no longer defines your life and who you are, you are then entering the world that everybody else lives in, which is how to minimize the morbidity and mortality associated with unstable weight, with metabolic syndrome, and with some of the other challenges that face all of us, and about which we in the eating disorder community have been a bit absent, We've been absent from the discussion because we are so fearful of fat stigma. We are so fearful that people will begin to exert the same kind of uh, pressures and prejudice on kids of higher body weight that they have exerted on our kids who struggle with eating disorder symptoms. So it's a tangled web we weave. And this is intensely complex. And we just put our toe in the water at Cartini Clinic of some of this stuff. And so I want to share that with you. Okay. So we, I am going to start with the basics. But unless you want to ask me anything about this, I, I think you guys know this time's 10. Right? right. <laughs> is this a newsflash for anybody? No. Yeah, really. Without weight restoration, you will get nothing. This is not a newsflash in this room, it's a newsflash outside these doors. So, first, this, this is what's important not only for parents, this is important for doctors. Know the normal. Only when you know the normal, the spectrum of normal, and the fact that kids come in all shapes and sizes, can you begin to understand how any given child's illness deviates from their normal. Okay, so critical role of growth charts. Talking a little bit about weight restoration in kids. I know from talking to all of you over the years that one of the, the major things that people struggle with is not only how do I set reasonable weight goals, but how do I bring my pediatrician on board. Good luck with that. How do I bring my dietitian on board? Really good luck with that. You have to understand the principles behind it. So the growth chart in the United States has, is a standard for pediatric care. If you see a pediatrician or a family doctor and have seen, if your child has, you should have growth charts on your child. Now Charlotte told me, oops, in the UK they don't do growth charts. So I don't know what to say about that. But if you are an American parent in the American system, we have a lot of disadvantages. But one advantage we have is growth chart. And it's really important to be the only that growth chart. They are invaluable in establishing goal weights. But it's very critical for you to know and not feel like you're crazy when you're talking to your pediatrician that a normal appearing centile can still be absolutely abnormal. Just because the child is still on the curve somewhere, much less that ridiculous 10% PMI that the French talked about, does not mean that they are at a healthy weight. And just because they're at the 95th centile for weight does not mean that they weigh too much. It all depends on their genetics and on their growth pattern, which you will have some insight into by looking at your own child's growth chart. Even a fat child can be very, very sick. This is Cindy Bulick talking, eating disorders occurring individuals who are underweight, normal weight, 
overweight and obese. Never forget it. Boys may go unsuspected, and overweight boys can be very ill before the diagnosis is made. Back to principles, recognizing eating disorders as brain disorders. I find that when a conversation gets complex and you can't really tease out pieces, remember, brain disorder. That is a very powerful uh, message, and one that I have been excoriated for um, over the years. I mean, Laura and I had um, a disagreement with the Academy of Eating Disorders. Uh, I, uh, being kind of the firebrand I am, I just withdrew from the forum. That's it. I'm not coming back. You guys, talk amongst yourselves. I'm too mad. Because they said there will be no discussion about brain disorders. And there will be no further discussion about parents not causing eating disorders. The AED. So, I think they regretted it. But, um, but that was a while ago. So eating disorders, like other severe mental illnesses, all of them, every last one of them, are brain disorders. So here's another basic principle. Recognize anosognosia. Isn't that hard to say? Anosognosia. It is critical to understanding why it's so doggone hard. And anosognosia is not a strange concept to physicians. It just doesn't occur to them to apply it to our patients. So anosognosia means the brain does not recognize that there's a problem. And if there's not a problem, why is everybody picking on me? Why are they trying to get me to eat this food, which um, our keynote speaker so so beautifully illustrated the role of anxiety in, in the etiology, in the maintenance of anorexia nervosa. Patients with anorexia nervosa cannot perceive that they have a problem. Now, not every patient has anosognosia. There, there is a slice of, of patients with anorexia nervosa or restrictive eating disorders who say, I have a problem, it's ruining my life, I want help. They tend to be older kids. The 10-year-olds are, are developmentally not there. All they realize is that mommy and daddy are worried and crying. So we have a problem. So their brain either completely denies or minimizes the extent of the compromise. This means that parents and providers will need to take charge of treatment on behalf of the child. It's just that simple. This one brain dysfunction, anosognosia, determines how hard eating disorders can be to treat. Simple, actually. Weight loss in chapter is not normal. And <laughs> the reward is in heaven. But you need to do it. You guys are experts in that. I don't need to tell you. So, why is weight restoration important to state at all? And we'll, talk, we'll define state a little bit closer. Brian Last and I argue about this all the time. Brian says, who owns this weight issue anyway, Julie? I think you should stop weighing your patients. Well, I really, really respect this out of the box thinker that Brian Last is. But I'm with you guys, I'm in the trenches. It's like, well, okay, on some other planet, we will stop weighing everybody. But for right now, to keep these kids safe, we have to know where they are on their trajectory. So, although weight restoration is not everything, please don't believe that just because your child is now at a normal weight for them, all of a sudden, the, the cognitions disappear. Remember, brain disorder. So when you're struggling with why is my child still unhappy or still affected or still has these thoughts, still believes she's fat, when I was told that if I just got her weight up, everything would go away, well, it's because it is a brain disorder. And we're splashing around in the shallow end. So unless you get weight restoration, and this is the core of what I'm going to talk about, the brain will refuse to believe that the famine is over. And a lot of dysfunctional metabolic processes flow downhill from the brain being convinced that it's still in a famine 
even though you're weight restored and even though you're eating. There are long-term consequences to semi-starvation. The obvious one, the less obvious, but possibly even more important one, everybody's all worried that their kids won't be as tall as they're supposed to be. How about not being as smart as they're supposed to be? That's a heck of a lot more important. And what we, Debbie Katzman in Toronto has done some work showing that uh, lack of estrogen has a profound effect on cognition. Estrogen is, is the end of it. It's the end of the chain that is initiated by a dysfunctional response, metabolic response, to starvation and to refeeding. Social stunting, everybody knows this. It, it, it's one of the real tragedies of eating disorders. They eat up everything else. They take up all space on the hard disk. Pretty soon, there is no life. Osteopenia, osteoporosis, and stress fractures, that, that impresses all the doctors. I don't know why. It's, <laughs> I mean, it, it's important, but please. Social stunting, cognitive abilities, these are the, this is where, really, where the rubber meets the road for our children. And disrupted insulin production and disrupted glucose metabolism. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit today that, to my knowledge, we haven't really um, spoken about much in our field. Chronic low mood and low energy from hypoglycemia, and I'm not talking about the hypoglycemia of starvation. I'm talking about the hypoglycemia that occurs in some people who have type 2 diabetes genetics in their family with refeeding and post-refeeding. Laura? Can you clarify, when you're speaking, speaking of semi-starvation, are you only talking in the context of anorexia nervosa strictly, or also endnose and weight? Oh, thank you very much, in any context. So, and, and not only starvation, but really dysfunctional eating. So people who suffer from binge eating disorder are also uh, under-talked about, under-loved, under-cherished, right, uh, and otherwise slammed. They go through periods of less obvious semi-starvation as a compensatory mechanism to binging. So people with binge eating disorders will, will experience these horrible binges. It's a brain disorder. The brain is forcing, this is not lack of willpower or uh, some kind of a personality flaw. This is a terrible brain disorder. So they binge, their, their conscious mind, their higher, fun, you know, higher level of functioning is appalled, humiliated, embarrassed, now they restrict the next day because they're, to, of course, thereby setting themselves up to binge again. But it, to answer your question, this really applies to everybody. And we're doing what we call metabolic fingerprinting, so metabolic testing on all kids. Kids of high body weight, binge eating disorders, bulimia nervosa, anorexia nervosa. The problem is that any tertiary referral center, whether it's Cartina Clinic or whether it's Stanford or whether it's UCSD, we see a disproportionate number of kids with anorexia nervosa, even though it's probably the more rare condition, because it comes to medical attention so swiftly in comparison to the others. Not because it's in some way different. I don't think it's different. Um, okay. Poor muscle strength despite exercise or because of it. And I'm about to put one of the sacred cows of American life on the stand for slaughter. It gets me in trouble a lot. It's called exercise. So, state markers. We desperately need new markers of state besides just weight. I think parents are crying out for this, kids are crying out for that. And to the extent that we are able to tell our patients here at, at Cartini Clinic, we're looking for a certain state, not a certain weight. They think that I have this number in my mind, like 148 pounds, I'm 5'3", 148 pounds, that's obviously way too high. The parents believe I have some number in mind. I actually have no number in mind. I don't really actually care what anybody weighs. But we are forced to take an educated guess, right? So we. We take an educated guess at where we're likely to have to wind up, 148 pounds, 120 pounds, whatever, 250 pounds for a boy who's 6'7", 
Um, and then we start to move towards it and see what happens. And of course, the first things you're going to see are the things that you guys have all reported. You begin to see the sparkle come back in the eyes, the color come back in the cheeks. You begin, parents say, I'm getting my son back. I'm getting my daughter back. Sense of humor predictably returns at a certain stage. In an ideal trajectory, menstruation will return, or if you're doing metabolic fingerprinting like we are, testosterone will return, and with it, mood, muscle strength, and mood. Um, so you can't, it's, it's frustrating because you can't tell that you're there until you're there, right? You can you move towards this mythical number that you use the growth chart to figure or approximate, and now you need to look at how this individual child's biology responds to what you're doing. So new state markers really ideally should be objective and easily measured without surgical or imaging intervention. So we do um, do some pelvic ultrasounds, and we used to do a lot more than incredibly helpful despite the literature that comes out of the UK about them. But how easy is it if you can do a blood test that gives you some idea of where you are in this trajectory towards a healthy state? They should relate to outcome. In other words, they should matter. They should matter to mood. They should matter to muscle strength. They should matter to menstruation. They shouldn't just be lab tests for the sake of lab tests. And ideally, their relationship to weight should not be easily calculated so that they don't become a proxy for figuring out how much you weigh. My doctor won't tell me how much I weigh, but he told me my BMI was 13, I know I'm 5'3". <coughs> you know, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to get from there to here. So ideally, these state markers, BMI is a terrible state marker for a, a, an encyclopedia of reasons, right? Um, percent body fat is probably even worse. Now, people who deal with metabolic problems like metabolic syndrome do look at percent body fat. It's very useful. Oh, it's the two-inch sword if ever there was one, though, for our patients. If you were routinely measuring their percent body fat to tell how well they were, you would be down the rabbit hole. Calculating change in height can be powerful if your child is still young enough to be experiencing linear growth. So girls will quit growing about two years after the initiation of menstruation. Now that can be thrown off a little bit because if you get anorexia nervosa sometime in that period of time, it will arrest your growth and then you'll do catch up growth. And so if it arrests your growth at say 12, and you don't really get weight restored until you're 15. That happens a lot. And not, it doesn't happen to us, but it happens for people who are not fanatics about weight restoration. Then you may still be growing at 15, which would be out of the range of usual for a girl. Um, um, genetics and epigenetics are both biology. So state is strongly influenced by genetics and even epigenetics. Take a detailed family history, no matter who you are. And as a parent, know your child's family history, unless it's unavailable to you because of adoption or death or whatever. Uh, we, we do resemble our closest genetic relatives. And uh, some of our responses to refeeding are going to depend on our uh, inherited abilities to metabolize glucose, to secrete insulin, to, uh, and, will, and, and uh, to have normal thyroid hormones. I'm always amused when I hear talks um, in the eating disorder conferences where people talk about epigenetics. It's frequently mental health providers they love epigenetics because they're sick and tired of people like me, always talking about genetics, 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 right? And biology, biology. And somehow they think that epigenetics means there are all these psychosocial factors that after all really do matter. Well, guess what? It's all biology. We swim in the biology of our environment. Our environment, like it or not, 
everything about us, it's not my asthma, it's actually, unfortunately for those of us who don't like biochemistry, numbers like the mom, it's actually all biology. But the biology of our environment absolutely interacts with the biology of our individual brains. It's on a fluid continuum. That's what epigenetics is really about. People respond differently to refeeding, depending in part on their genetics, as reflected in their extended family history. This is very, very complex, and it can go unexpectedly right or unexpectedly wrong. So when we first started looking at this metabolic fingerprinting, the number one problem that puzzled us, the clinical day-to-day -day problem that we just could not figure out, was the apparently weight-restored girl who does not get ovulatory periods back. It's common. Now, how common is it in a clinic like ours where, we, where as I say, weight restoration fanatics? I'm going to say, and, and this is a guess, that it could be, it could be 15%, maybe. It could, maybe it's 10% of girls who, despite apparent weight restoration, don't menstruate. Now, in the past, what we always said was, you need to gain more weight. We don't have a problem with that. You need to gain more weight. But it, even we started to get a little bit uncomfortable with kids who were very apparently weight restored, way past where they had ever been, and I'm talking now about girls who are no longer growing, way past what you'd expect from their family norms. So at some point, you have to say, stop. OK, stop. The weight gain, we clearly do not have the rest of the story. What is the rest of the story? So we were thrilled when one of our colleagues in Seattle uh, named Emily Cooper showed us how to understand the rest of the story. And that's partially what I want to talk about um, today. We are in the infancy of clinical awareness of state. Okay. Definitions of state that I'm going to talk about are relevant across all diagnoses, just as Laura asked. The obesity research is running along beside us as state, the state in recovery from an eating disorder is very similar to state in recovering from chronic dieting of any etiology. So in Dr. Cooper's practice, because she doesn't see people with eating disorders anymore, um, she sees a lot of athletes who had bariatric surgery and who continue to gain weight despite bariatric surgery, who invariably have a lifelong history of dieting. And uh, famously, diets don't work, right? They will continue to try to diet and exercise their way back to normalcy. It doesn't work for them. It doesn't work for our kids. Dieting, semi-starvation, upsets the apple cart of how we metabolize food. And women, if we perceive or can perceive, hunger and satiety. This is, this is really critically important. We discovered from treating a couple of cancer kids at Cartini Clinic with cancer cachexia or cancer, cancer wasting that patients who have no appetite for any reason, in the case of cancer, certain cancers with uh, elaborate uh, a peptide that goes up to the melanocort four system of the brain, switches off appetite, switches up the metabolic rate, <laughs> and so of course, they lose weight. They become cachectic, and this will dramatically worsen their prognosis. It's been studied in rats um, and shown that for certain cancers, just refeeding the rat, not even treating the cancer, makes the rat live despite the cancer for a very long time. So we thought that was critically important information. We have not been able to. Um, interest our colleagues in oncology and pediatric oncology enough to have them, please, we, we know how to feed kids, right? Let us feed those kids. Um, this, you know, this is sort of an, un, an unexplored corner of uh, refeeding children that I think has a lot of potential for importance. But the point here is that, that appetite is all about biochemistry and that many things can go wrong with your perception of appetite. Binge eating disorder is a classical example of that. 
So what are some of the state markers we've recently been following? Thyroid function, free T3, free T4, TSH. Oh, this makes the doctor so happy. <laughs> Concrete things, you can measure them. They don't you know, correlate easily enough to weight that you can actually tell um, how much you weigh. These, we love these. Now, how you respond is going to depend on your genetics. Nutritional markers, we love these even more. C3, that's complement three, and T3, that's uh, thyroid hormone three, that's the active thyroid hormone. Total, so the total T3 and C3, it turns out, are nutritional markers. So you can tell whether you're underfueled. Oh, this is so handy. So you can imagine, you get up to where these, you're, you're, you're going for state, right? The kid looks pretty good. You think you probably are giving them enough food. And amount of food does not correlate in a straight line, by the way, with weight, as I'm sure all of you have experienced, right? And, uh, and you get total T3 and C3, and they're below 100, and you know they are under fuel. You need to add food. Now, what we've seen is when, when people are weight restored, and under fuel for, for whatever they're doing with their lives, they will not necessarily gain weight because you add more fuel. Leptin, really important one. Ah, the leptin story in anorexia nervosa is really important, and we're just beginning to understand the role it plays. Fasting glucose and insulin, in some case, glucose tolerance tests. Uh, our glucose tolerance tests are typical for cartini, we do it our own way. And, um, so these are not glucose tolerance tests where you drink a thing of glucose because we don't actually care about how you respond to a glove of glucose that you will never drink. We care how you <laughs> respond to food. So our kids go in fasting, they take their cartini breakfast with them, and they get fasting insulin and glucose drawn, they eat their breakfast, then they get insulin and glucose drawn in. 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes. Turns out to be very important and very interesting. And then the sex steroids. Luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, estradiol, and testosterone. What problems are we trying to solve? Persistent amenorrhea, despite apparent weight restoration. PCOS, do you guys know what this is? Polycystic ovarian syndrome. There is an epidemic of it. It seems to run in tandem with met, uh, metabolic syndrome, where an astonishing number of young women are developing PCOS-like symptoms, which result in not no periods, but irregular periods, and um, deranged glucose metabolism. Low energy and mood. This is a big one, right? This is as parents. This is what, I mean, if we could solve this problem without resorting to restricting, we would be really happy. Constant hunger, poor satiety cues, and binging. A lot of people in recovery from starvation, any etiology, but in our case, kids recovering from restricting anorexia, um, will report, just like the kids who have binge eating disorder, they can't really tell. They're starved in the middle of the day, which of course, completely freaks them out. And they have no idea. They think it's because we've made them fat and now their brain is turned on to eating and they're gonna eat and eat and eat until they get fatter and fatter, they're completely freaked out. So understanding in what way hunger and satiety cues can be deranged by refeeding is really important, Sarah. Why would you consider constant hunger a problem that needs to be solved rather than kind of a normal reaction to a malnourished state? Well, it's, it, it's by normal, you mean it happens usually, I agree. If by normal you mean it's the preferred uh, homeostatic response, I, I don't agree. So I think that um, when you're constantly hunger, hungry, uh, that is understandable biologically, not sustainable, and in the long run, unhealthy because it's gonna lead you to where you don't wanna go no matter who you are. And uh, the Minnesota Semi-Starvation Study really looked at that because those guys whom they uh, semi-starved went through um, episodes of binging 
Um, they normalized after about two years. It went away. You know, the brain was on fire. The fire gradually burnt out. That's fine if you don't have an eating disorder. If you have an eating disorder, that is going to stir up God's own anxiety about gaining weight. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? Please feel free to interrupt me. All right. Continued weight gain, overshooting the goal. Again, we don't like to talk about that because we have a hard enough time getting everybody to what we think is a, an adequate weight, and it's such an uphill slog against the doctors who are, you know, telling you you're fine because you're still on the tenth centile for, you know, girls your age and so forth. That is such an uphill slog for everybody that we really don't want to know about the fact that some people can, will, and do overshoot the mark in weight. And does that matter? And what does it mean? And what are we going to do about it? OK, state markers of the thyroid. Let's go into some of these in a little bit more detail. The thyroid gland, the thyroid gland is controlled by the brain. TSH is the whip that the brain uses to stimulate the gland to produce um, T3 and T4. In a famine, the brain will turn down thyroid hormones to reduce the metabolic rate to conserve energy. So that's been one of the little sort of side eddies of this metabolic fingerprinting that we're doing. That Dr. Moshdell and I see that our kids are technically hypothyroid because the TSH, while still in the normal range, is high, too high. And um, we give them a little bit of, of thyroid, we can bring the TSH down. Are we treating a number? No. What are we treating? Mood, energy, and muscular, return to muscular. Strength. So, yes, please. Have you seen a lot of kids diagnosed with Hashimoto's uh, disorder when really they have anorexia nervosa? Yeah, Is yeah, we do. I mean, they shouldn't really be calling them Hashimoto's unless they get thyroid antibodies and they're all elevated. Then that's Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But, um, you know, and oddly, all the doctors in the past who who thought that the kids were hypothyroid when actually they had anorexia, were, were, they were right in a way. It's just like you're, you know, you're fixing the headlight on the car whose engine won't work. First, <laughs> first you better get the engine to work and then you worry about fixing the headlight. And so this is just a little side edge of this T4, but don't underestimate how mood and energy, how important that is to all of us. How long might you need to do this thyroid treatment? Is it something short term, long term? Well, um, we don't know exactly the answer to that. We anticipate doing it maybe for a year past adequate weight restoration because at some point the brain will be leaving. Now you can look at other things. You can look at the rest of the metabolic fingerprinting and as that starts to normalize it, that sooner you just taper down on the thyroid hormone and get it off. Um, in particular, if leptin is normal and uh, estradiol is normal, then you can be pretty sure that the brain has decided that the famine is over. The other interesting thing that we have seen at now doing this metabolic fingerprinting is that a lot of our patients with anorexia, not, and I am not talking about just in the very beginning, when of course everything's wrong, um, but even, even weight restored, halfway weight restored and so forth, you, um, see very low insulins. So it turns out that the brain is the only organ that does not need uh, to use insulin to grab onto glucose. The muscles all need insulin, everything else needs insulin to grab onto glucose. So what the brain is doing is saying, I'm the most important organ in the body, and by God, I'm getting all the sugar. So all of these things play off of each other in the definition of state. Somebody had a question over here? Um, the thyroid hormones and the mood, what do you mean when you are talking about mood? Are you talking about depression? Are you um, no, I'm not talking about clinical depression. I'm just talking about mood, you know, right. And, and energy. And I think energy is in some ways a less charged word than mood. But none of us feel good when we have no energy. We rely on our innate 
sense of energy for, a, for a, an adequate sense of well-being. Okay. We still have a question. Yes, oh please, oh please, yes. When you're talking about this, when you're talking about these state markers, right. the disease can cherry pick what it wants to uh, basically be affecting these different markers. In other words, in my daughter's case, all of her blood work always came back down. Well, and they weren't doing this blood work, I'll bet you. Oh yeah. Really? Oh yeah. So her C3 were normal with trouble tests? Her C3 I'm not sure of, but the yeah. fibroids always been normal. Her, um, her, you know, all of the components of the thyroid, the bone scans, um, I don't, I the sex steroids. Actually, at one point, those were a little bit different. And she, you know, she was anorexic, anorexic at the time. Um, she had a borderline. Um, US. But at any rate, that's one thing that always surprises us when she gets blood work now, is that these markers are coming back fine. Well, it's in the eye of the beholder. So there's an interesting article in the British Medical Journal looking at keeping the TSH below 2. Right. So usually when, they, when the doctors say it came back normal, they would regard three as normal or four yeah, as normal. I have, I have hypothyroidism, so I know that they right. adjusted that and right. I look at the results, and she's never, she hasn't developed that disease yet with drugs in her family. Right. So my point is, uh, it's giving her a false sense of security okay. at, at 21. Okay. Well, if you knew what her leptin was, that would help you. I'll ask if they check that. Right. And do they, yes. to get a leptin level, that is of the cartini clinic. I don't it's like really hard for us to get it in the field. Uh, well your doctor can just order a leptin and, and every time they try to do that, we try to number one convince the physicians to do that. That's the hard part. Yeah. 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 What's a leptin level? Well because he or she knows that they're gonna have to interpret it. You know, yes. and when you, that's why they won't get it. It's not to get a lab test and then, then this mom wants me to tell her what it means, and I have not the faintest idea. I know. This is the problem. So I, I told not me. We thought long and hard about presenting on our metabolic fingerprinting. Where you know, and I've been telling everybody for some time, oh, it's not ready for prime time yet. And I finally decided, well, what is prime time? If we have information that families could conceivably use, then we better start talking about it. So and Namai said, yeah, but what if everybody says, will you call my doctor on the phone and tell him what happened? <laughs> I said, yeah, well, we can't do that. Uh, and that is, of course, for some time going to remain a problem. So we're still gathering the evidence to, to understand how kids with, in particular kids with eating disorders, respond to repeating. Yes. I'm reading the lectures well for these other um, is an endocrinologist um, unbiased enough to be able to just give feedback about the level, or does an endocrinologist have to be educated in eating disorders to give a true reading given the question that's just asked? Educated in eating disorders, I'm afraid, and also have you tried to get in to see a pediatric eating uh, endocrinologist recently? I mean, ours have three, four month waiting lists, and then to you know, to wait four months to get in to hear them say, well, you know, we, I don't, nobody really knows about leptin, or, you know, this thyroid looks normal, that's not hypothyroid. Um, this is really on the cutting edge of, of our understanding. Now, it doesn't mean that there isn't some pediatric endocrinologist out there who's ahead of us, who knows more than we do, who's, you know. But if you find that person, please let us all know. Was there a question over? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I know this is in the infancy state, but I kind of always wondered this, that um, even when your weight restored, can an eating disorder cause this metabolic problem like for the rest of your life? Can those numbers be affected? I, mean, I know you heard you can say, I don't know. What's your gut feel? Oh, my gut feel is yes. And though when everybody is asking me tearfully and anxiously, has this affected her heart? Because, you know, the patients are in the hospital and they're bradycardic and the parents are naturally freaked out as I would be. 
Um, and that's the most common question is, has this affected her heart for good? And I have come to think that the answer is going to be, well, no, not exactly her heart for good. Perhaps not her brain for good if we're lucky. But her, uh, her metabolism might well be affected for a long time. Starvation is not good for children and other living things, right? <laughs> we, we know that. And this, this is being brought home to us in a big way. Binging and purging is not good for you. Um, and binge eating is not good for you. Nobody imagines that it is. But people minimize the impact of this on, on the uh, general metabolism once the symptoms have ceased. So by the way, um, low thyroid causes low body temperature, a lower heart rate. This is the brain turning down the metabolic fires. And a lower, lower uh, level of activity in general. Over time, it can cause mental dulling and low mood. Put those up there so we can all agree we don't like the thyroid not to work. Sometimes simple weight restoration convinces the brain to turn the thyroid back on <coughs> as, soon as, as soon as you're there. But sometimes it doesn't. So uh, this is just talking a little bit more about the TSH and how we use small doses. And by small doses, I mean 25 micrograms of L-thyroxine, sometimes 50. Um, family history of hypothyroidism being unmasked by starvation but you're titrating it to the TSH, right? So you don't just say, eh, I think I'll go to 50. No, you have to check, recheck the TSH and titrate to the TSH. Um, state markers of nutritional sufficiency are actually um, easier and simpler. And they, they are something that I think you could ask your pediatrician to uh, draw, but, but you are going to have to be the one to do something. So it's, it's fairly simple in that total T3 and C3 should be above 100. So when you are adequately fueled, uh, then they should be like around 110, 112, something like that. 90, you need more food. So this is useful stuff for us to have. This is a towards a blood test for adequacy of refeeding. That's what gets us excited about it. Quick checks. Leptin, so leptin is a hormone produced by fat cells that signal to the brain, the fat cells are signaling via leptin to the leptin receptors in various parts of the brain. There are enough of us now, you can turn off the food seeking behaviors that keep us all alive. So when leptin is really low, the brain thinks it's still in a famine. It will turn on anxiety, it will turn on feeding behaviors and food seeking behaviors, and it will turn off luteinizing hormone, which turns off estradiol, so no period. So low leptin turns out to be the thread that we are really seeing in our patients. For those patients who, despite apparent weight restoration, still have no period, we look at their leptin, it's really low. So, here we, this just restates that leptin suppresses LH, LH suppresses estradiol, low estradiol, no ovulatory periods, no periods, no remission, so what suppresses leptin, right? So that's the real question is, OK, we get it. You can measure the leptin, and it's really low, and that's what's keeping it from getting a period. But what suppresses leptin? Starvation. OK, we can take care of that. Vitamin C. This was, wow, newsflash for us. Vitamin C. So in kids, treating kids of higher body weight with metabolic syndrome who have leptin really sky-high leptins that you need to bring down so the brain can hear uh, the cells if they would just stop shouting. We use 1,000 milligrams a day of vitamin C, it suppresses leptin. So when we, conversely, when we have kids where we're trying to get their leptin back up to normal, we make sure they're not inadvertently, through some idea of good health, slugging down a lot of vitamin C. And this is where the rubber meets the road. Aerobic exercise, classically running, suppresses leptin. I wish it weren't so. I'd be a lot more popular doctor. <laughs> it's really true. The hardest thing 
that you will tell a patient, especially once they are weight restored, is honey, running is not is not your friend. It's just not your friend. And we said, oh, I'll love to run. So and the, then the parents will step in and say, yes, but but you don't understand. Running is what gives her, a, you know, what calms her anxiety, what gives her a good mood. I mean, running makes her feel good. Yeah, I said, well, you know, <laughs> shooting heroin makes people feel good. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Because, and, and again, shooting heroin is all about brain chemistry. Just because something makes you feel good, alas, does not mean that it's good for you. And, you know, it's a joke to say it about heroin, a tragic joke to say it about heroin. <laughs> but this is real, this causes real turmoil for the kids. There's a question, yes, sir. Yes, running is a track or long distance and inverse? Well, as far as we can tell, um, sprinting would be preferable to running track. But any exercise is going to, when leptin is really low, when leptin is below 10, you probably should not exercise. So, um, I finally, and this is, uh, you know, the classically the problem for some of our older girls, and you can talk until you're blue in the face, and the parents are defensive of what they see as their child's happiness, uh, totally understandably. Um, and finally, I just have to say, let me know when you want to get serious about getting your period back. Until then, let's talk about something else. Um, because, you know, the, this is the last, this is the last stumbling block, and it's a big one. And it's a big one because really parents have often not internalized, and certainly pediatricians have not internalized, um, how bad for you it is not to have your estrogen, not to have your cycles. So, Laura? Equally true for men is uh, for boys and girls. Yes, thank you. Um, equally true. And um, so what happens in boys, and thank you for mentioning that, I thought I had it on here, is that it'll turn off testosterone. So, and testosterone, low mood, you know, even if they're, you know, even if they're not planning on getting anyone pregnant, <laughs> notoriously, men who, who who have no testosterone are not feeling good about their, you know, sense of well-being. Um, and, and so, in terms of dose, I can see distance running, but does that extend to sports like basketball, soccer? God, any data um, I don't, we don't have any data at all. All we have is um, not that there isn't some data. You know, sitting down on top of everybody else's research. But um, I think to re the realization that we're coming to is you have to stop, stop, stop. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Stop, stop trying to negotiate with me, but how about uh, your, uh, your <laughs> Stop, just stop. And get your period back. And get it back three times, and then, then we're going to call it good. But keep in mind, if you then stop menstruating, we know there's a problem. So that that's that's where we try to head the kids. There was a question back. She's I think she's asking me if uh, if you get the left level levels back up and then you would it be okay to run and if you're asking me, <laughs> if you play with snakes, you're going to get bit. I would think of something else to do besides running. Unfortunately, and understandably, it's very popular. It doesn't cost anything. You don't have to buy a whole kit to do it. You can do it on your own. You can do it wherever you are. It releases endorphins. I mean, yeah, we, we get it. You know what Craig uh, Johnson said at, uh, I think it was the Peace Conference, maybe last time, or the time, yeah. He said, when he's asked that question by parents, he says to them, well, as soon as you saved up enough money for a second round of treatment, you know, great. <laughs> That's even more right out there than I think. Mean. So, parents are like, whoa. So I'm, the, it, I'm, I'm not trying to disguise it as good news. It's bad news. It makes people very unhappy with me. I honestly did not invent it. I think I know your answer to this, but my daughter's been negotiating with this devil for 10 years, and she reads a lot, so she knows a lot. Right. And she knows that she has osteopenia, mm -hmm. so she weightlifts to excess. Mm -hmm. 
but she says she's not running, she's weightlifting on her own, so she's hurting herself less. Is there any truth for that? Um, there could be, you mean, vis-a-vis -vis osteopenia, does she have normal periods? I don't know. I don't think she does. She well, says she does. I don't. So if she doesn't have normal periods, uh, so her state, you know, her, I never even mind what her weight is, I don't know, but her state is not right. You have to say just not. Um, just a comment. There was, there was a randomized controlled trial uh, that came out a few years ago that actually found that a supervised program of yoga uh, I believe it was once or twice a week, um, was actually beneficial to some of the um, emotional and cognitive symptoms of anorexia, bulimia, and ednos in adolescents. I think it might be, uh, in almost all cases, good cognitively, but then you'd have to know. But it didn't, but, and it did not interfere with weight restoration. Did it, but do you think it, it did they look at menses? Um, I believe it didn't interfere with menses either. Okay. So they, people did the same whether or not they received the yoga in uh -huh. terms of um, you know weight restoration and menses, but the people that got the yoga mm -hmm. improved on other measures right. of eating disorder. Well. Yeah. Okay. So it's mm -hmm. not aerobic. No, no, it was not. It was not hot. It was no, <laughs> yeah. not hot yoga. Not not <laughs> vinyasa yoga. No. So you know, to know the answer, you have to go one click further and take that cohort who. Um, or amenorrhea and weight restore and see what happened to them. You know what I mean? Because it could be that if, 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 if only a narrow slice of people remains amenorrhea despite weight restoration, that everybody in that study, coincidentally, was destined to have their periods. You know, so you wouldn't know the answer about the state markers unless you measured leptin and estradiol. Then you'd know. Is there a um or uh, drug supplement to increase leptin? There's leptin. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you lived in Europe, oh, okay. so our FDA has not approved yet um, exogenous leptin. Oh, okay. What do you do that? I'm sorry. Exogenous means, oh, it's where you take it. You know. And what about nutritional reserves? Are there foods that have more <laughs> leptin? Promoting uh, capabilities. Well, you know, uh, like weight restoration. I mean, fat. You have to. You have to have adequate fat in your diet, really, to get weight restored <laughs> and get balanced. You had a question. My question is back to the vitamin C. I yeah. missed something. I think you're saying high levels suppress leptin. Uh, yes. And low levels. Uh, if you give you vitamin C, you can suppress leptin. Right. So we wouldn't want to suppress leptin in this population that we're talking about. Right. But in people who have high leptins um, and metabolic syndrome, kids of high body weight and so forth, we give them vitamin C to suppress their leptin. So in the case of the kids who are recovering from eating disorders who have low leptin, we would try to make sure that they weren't getting vitamin C somewhere, too much vitamin C somewhere, and that that was helping suppress their leptin. So if a pediatrician is checking a vitamin C level, more than likely you should be looking at it being whether too high. I wasn't sure why. Oh, that's an interesting point. We don't check vitamin C levels. I was I just talking about. I mean, really? pediatrician, we haven't gotten back yet because they had an error and it's not treated. Oh, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, that's <laughs> vitamin C and zinc were two of the we check zinc. And the PSH, but not all the other markers. But okay. anyhow, I was just curious whether it would so You're looking at high levels no. if you're going to check it to make sure it's not suppressing your left. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think we have time either for one more question. Or I know Dr. O'Keefe didn't completely finish her comments because there was so much interest. There might be that she has a couple of closing points she wants to make. And, and I don't know if we'll be able to hear uh, during the rest of the day. Um, but I want to be sure we have a big well, let me just say, let me just go into the one last thing that suppresses leptin that is quite common in the population that we're talking about um, with low leptin, and that is hypoglycemia. So, hypoglycemia, we're talking about postprandial hypoglycemia. Not the hypoglycemia you get because you didn't eat, but the deranged hypoglycemia you get when you eat, and by you I mean some people who have the genetics 
for this kind of thing, will drop their blood sugar after they eat. And this suppresses leptin, suppresses LA, <coughs> suppresses estradiol, no period. So we are working on ways to try to contain the, the hypoglycemia, the postprandial hypoglycemia. First you have to identify it, so you have to have the glucose tolerance test. And then you have to do some just kind of homemade, at this point, in children, because many of the drugs that are used in adults, like GLP-1 agonists and so forth by injection, are not approved for kids. Um, so what, the first line thing that we do, and has helped some kids, is spread their food out. Now, notoriously, Cartini Clinic does three meals in one afternoon snack. I get asked about this all the time, because there are people who believe it's better to eat small amounts continuously. We think that contributes to the constant focus on food. But guess what? It isn't one size fits all. So we think that the majority of people do well with three meals and one afternoon snack, but those who have postprandial hypoglycemia need to have eat, they need to have breakfast, an hour later snack, two hours later lunch, an hour later snack, a little bit of snack before dinner, and that kind of stuff, to, to smooth out the, the blood sugar and to try to get that, uh, to release the leptin. Any, yeah, well, when, they, when they have postcranial hypoglycemia, what is their insulin doing? And, and what, how far postcranial? Again, it depends on their genetics, 30, 60, 90 minutes. Uh, and and uh, many people who have the type 2 diabetes um, geno genes, which, by the way, is a lot of people, um, will have hyperinsulinemic <coughs> postprandial hypoglycemia. Yeah. And this will complicate their life later on. So more to come, that's just like I say, the toe in the water up towards a, a definition of state, because we all believe wait, without weight restoration we're gonna get nothing, but we want everything. Okay.